couple of scriptures up there before we get into the meat of this story. Uh, Psalm 47. It says, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king. You know, from the Lord's perspective, he wants us to see him as a king. And he calls us to sing praise. And so when you say uh, sing praise to God, sing praise to our king, it's the same person. For God is king over all the earth. Sing praises with the psalm. Do you believe that God is a king? Do you ever think of God as a king? I mean, there's a lot of different ways we think of the Lord. And it's because he is, uh, has many different aspects. We think of him as a, a father. You know, the word today from Betty about how he wants to draw close to us and comfort us. And there's that aspect of him. He's a shepherd. He is a warrior. There's a lot of, a lot of aspects that describe the nature of God. But one of them is a king. God is king of all the earth. And then in Psalm 103, 19, I have the verse up here that says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Now, we talked this morning about self-rule. You know, we, we can take on our own choices and, in a way, rule against God. That's really what caused the fall of man when Adam and Eve chose uh, to rule against the rule of God. And the Lord said, don't eat from this tree, and they chose to do it. So it was, it was self-rule rather than the rule of God. He is the king. They chose to reject it and rebel against it. And every day that we have choices to walk in obedience to the Lord, we choose rather to submit to the kingship of Jesus or to brush it aside. And every one of us has that choice and that opportunity every day of our life. The fact of the matter is he is the king. His throne is in the heavens, and he reigns over all. And one day, when everything is wrapped up on the earth, every human being that's ever lived will stand before him and bow before him and acknowledge him as king. It's best that we do it on this side, to do it now. Uh, you'll also find, and I have many scriptures, which I'm only going to bring out one here. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. This is just shortly after Jesus was baptized and began his ministry. It says, John was put in prison, and Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. You should do a study in the New Testament about the people who preached the kingdom. John the Baptist preached the kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom. Peter preached the kingdom. Paul preached the kingdom. Sometimes when we think about preaching, we think about preaching the gospel, but he calls it the gospel of the kingdom. There really is only good news when Jesus becomes the king. Because the king is the one who can then have the influence in our lives. And so it is called the gospel of the kingdom. You read the book of Matthew and you find so many stories and parables about the kingdom of God. Jesus is trying to show us what it's like to be under his rulership. The kingdom of God has a different set of laws in a way. I mean, think about this. Love your enemy. That's a different kind of a law, isn't it? We think about hating our enemy or despising our enemy or taking revenge on our enemy. Jesus comes in with a new kingdom. He says, I want you to love your enemy. And so he says, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It means change your way of thinking. There's a new king. There's a new way of living. There's a new way of following after God. And it really oftentimes does go against the grain of our own heart. Where we might want to take the revenge. He says, no, love your enemy. Or if somebody hits you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. This sounds so foreign to most of us. Uh, Jesus talks about if you want to be great, become the servant. That sounds so foreign. We think if we want to be great, we should trample all over people and rise to get to the top. And he says, no, be the servant of all. And so the rules of his kingdom are different. They're a different way of thinking. And so he says, repent or change your thinking because my kingdom is here. And the rest of our life as Christians, we are learning 
to be uh, embracing the kingdom of God, the rule of Christ in my life, the will of God. He is the king. At the end of Jesus' life, as he's standing before Pontius Pilate, I want you to turn to this scripture, and um, I want to ask you a question. How many times do you see the word my in this scripture? And I got, uh, I think there's several slides. So let's start here. How many, how many times do you see the word my in this particular verse that's on the screen right now? Not a trick question. <laughs> okay. There's four? Oh, there's five. Okay. So what are, what are they? What does he say, my, my what? Who's talking here? So if it's my kingdom and it's Jesus speaking, what that make him? He's king. There is a real kingdom. It's not the kingdom of this world. It's not the kingdom like Pontius Pilate understood. But it is a kingdom. It's a very real kingdom. But it's just different than what you might expect. It's not apparent. So he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom, there he says it again, right? My kingdom, if my kingdom were of this world, he says, my servants. What is that? I hope that's us. Maybe it's the angels. Maybe it's a combo. But if he's a king, and he has a kingdom, then he has servants in the kingdom. How many of you know a king with no servants is no king? What is he ruling over? <laughs> you know, I'm master of all I survey. What is it? Nothing there. There are my servants. He calls them my servants. I want to be one of them. And I'm hoping that all of us in our hearts this morning will say, you know, that's what I want to be. I have a kingdom, Jesus says, and I have servants. And we are they. My servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but there again, my kingdom is not from this world. So Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus said, you say that I am a king. For, now look, for this purpose, I was born. Now Jesus is going to tell us why he was born. Why did you come into the world, Jesus? This is one of the reasons. He says, for this purpose I was born, for this purpose I have come to the world, to bear witness to the truth. Think about that. Jesus is coming. He said one time, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and part of what Jesus was doing when he came to the earth was bearing witness to what is true. Everything he spoke was true. You might look at these words of Jesus that seem so foreign to the thinking of man and say, how can that be true? How can that be true? Jesus says, if you give, you receive. How can that be true? See, that, it doesn't seem obvious, does it? We think if I give... I lose. And Jesus says, no, if you give, you receive. He said, if, you, if you're like a seed and you fall into the ground and die, you will live. That sounds so corny, doesn't it? If I die, I will live? Yes. And Jesus said, I am coming to bear witness to the truth. And even though it may sound foreign to our thinking, it is the truth that he's bearing witness to. Everything he says is true. And then he says, For this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And listen to this now. Everyone who is of the truth listens, and here's the last my, listens to my voice. What is that talking about there? I think it's talking about obedience. It's talking about what the Great Commission is all about. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Don't you want to walk in truth? Well, if Jesus came to bear witness to the truth, 
Then to walk in truth, we need to walk into the words of Jesus. Walk in the teachings of Jesus. And so our whole life as a Christian, man or a woman or a child, is growing up, understanding that there is a king, that I'm part of a kingdom, that I'm a servant in that kingdom, and this king speaks. And he says, if you are of the truth, you will listen to my voice. And this word listen, you know, it's not like, yeah, I hear you. It's not that. It's the idea that you hear it and you take heed. Like my dad used to always tell us, if you go playing in the street, when I get home from work, you're going to get spanked. You hear me? Now, how many of you know he meant not just did it go into my ear, like a physical auditory thing. He meant, I want you to obey me. And so when Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, inherent in that word listen is paying attention and yielding. And everybody who is of the truth will listen to the voice of Jesus. I think it's possible, and I know it's possible because I've talked to people before and they will read some of the words of Jesus, and they'll say something like, well, that's, that part of the Bible I don't agree with. And I'm thinking, how can you, how can you pick a, and choose a part? There's always, there's always words of Jesus that kind of go along with how we feel, make us feel good, and say, I like that part. There's other parts of the Bible that do bring uh, correction to us. But if we're people of truth, if we are servants of the king, and if he is truly the king, then there's, a, there's an approach of our heart that says, I want to listen, Lord. I want to hear your voice. You're the king. Now, we'll go to the story now in Mark 10. Talk about this young man who came to Jesus. It's Mark 10, verse 17. As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him, before Jesus. And he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question. There was something in this young man's life that made him think about eternity. Made him think about, you know, uh, the shortness of his own life. I'm thinking about what's going to happen when I die and I want to inherit eternal life. How do I go about that? What do I do? You know, I bet you there's lots of people out here in the world today that wonder what's going to happen when I die. They've heard things, they've heard stories, they've heard Bible stories, and they're not really sure what it's like, but they're thinking, I wonder, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? And that's kind of what's on the heart of this young man. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Isn't that an awesome, I mean, an awesome little kid? You know, an awesome kid. How many would like to have this for a son? And it says, Jesus looked at him, looking at him, loved him. I love this picture of Jesus. He loved this man. His heart went out to him. Now, the words of Jesus are true. And he's about to tell this young man something he doesn't want to hear. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Do you believe that? That's hard to believe that, isn't it? See, because what, 
the reward, the, the, I guess the benefit side of this truth is you don't see it. You have to believe somehow in faith that Jesus said, if you give up everything you have, you'll have treasure in heaven. This is what you're asking me, isn't it? How do I have eternal life? I'm telling you. Give up everything, and you'll have treasure, and come and follow me. In a way, in a certain way, that's the challenge that comes to every one of us as we follow Jesus. It might not be that you're a wealthy person, but maybe there's something, one thing in your life that keeps you or keeps me, keeps us from kind of being all in for Jesus. wonder what it would be if you walked up to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he just puts a finger on something in your life. If he's true, if what he says is true, and he bears witness to the truth, why not just say, okay, Lord? You know, this guy's life would have been so much different if he'd have just done this one thing. It's fearful for us because you know, we talk a lot about this idea of, well, salvation's free. It is free. It is free. But it cost you something. Jesus said you have to take up your cross daily. There is a dying. There is a dropping your nets to follow me. It, it costs you something. It, it is a cost that says, I am surrendering to a king. He says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's it going to cost us? What, what, what does it cost us to make him the king of our life? It costs it cost everything. And so, Jesus said, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Disheartened by the saying. See, that's what happens when that word from Jesus comes to us and he sort of points to that one thing if we're not ready, if we're not ready to yield to the king, we become disheartened. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. See, he saw something that had great value to him. But what he couldn't see is there was something far more valuable over here. It's actually the thing that he was looking for. I want to inherit eternal life. Now, does that mean if you have money, you can't go to heaven? That's not, that's not what it means here. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in a, just a moment here. But the boy, he had this understanding of what he had in front of him. I have wealth. I have value. I have resources. It's meaningful to me. And you're telling me to lay that all aside, give it away to the poor, and then come and follow you, but that I'll have treasure in heaven? And Jesus said, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm bearing witness to the truth. But see, he couldn't see what was on the other side of that sail. He saw, I'm losing things that are important to me. I'm giving up what's valuable to me. But he did, he, for whatever reason, he could not grasp the value that Jesus was offering the treasure that's in heaven, the eternal life, a life of following him. And so he came to that crossroads in his life, and he chose to not walk in the truth of the king. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful. And then Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's not impossible. 
But it is difficult, he said. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. Here he didn't even put wealth as a precursor. He said it's just difficult. Why? Because you have to give something up. How difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So let me say, I just want to just go back through and just bring a few points out as we wrap this up this morning. First of all, the question of eternal life is really a question about the kingdom of God. See, his question was right there, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And as they had this discussion, this conversation, and the man walked away from it, whatever Jesus said he had to do, he walked away from it. Jesus said, you see, it's difficult to enter the kingdom of God. So he was equating eternal life with the kingdom. But we also live in the kingdom now. The Bible says when you're born again, you are taken from the kingdom of darkness, and brought into the kingdom of his dear son. We pray a prayer that goes something like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. And then like, almost like an additional phrase restating that, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this. This is how Jesus taught us to pray that God's rule, his kingdom, would be enforced in our life as we live out uh, our, our daily lives. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But there is also the kingdom that's coming, the future, when Jesus will reign over all. So let's walk through that conversation and why there was a disconnect. And I think that it's probably similar things that we have. I think the first thing that Jesus pointed out to this boy is he did not recognize Jesus for who he is. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good no one is good except God alone. Now, you, Jesus is not saying by this that I'm not God. He's saying that God is the only one that's intrinsically good. And if you're going to call me good, call me God. You're calling me good teacher, but if you're using the word good, that's only reserved for God. Are you seeing me just as a good teacher or are you seeing me as the king? God is the king over all the earth. That was Jesus' reproof here. Why do you call me good? There's none good but God. I'm more than a teacher. If you call Jesus a good teacher, you're just, you're just lumping him together with hundreds of good teachers. And how many of you know he's much greater than any teacher? Pick your greatest teacher that you ever heard from, the greatest book you've ever read, the greatest tape, the greatest sermon, the greatest whatever, None of them compare to Jesus by a long shot. He's God. And his words are true. And he brings life. And so he said to him, who am I really to you? Because I think in the end, how we view him really affects how we live. If Jesus is really God, and this guy can grasp that, and it's God who is saying to him, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Maybe it would have made a difference. Who knows? But if he's just a teacher, maybe it's just your opinion. You know, how do you look at the Word of God? How do you look at the teachings of Jesus? Do you see it as it is in truth the Word of God? 
That made a difference in the Thessalonians. Paul said, the things you heard from us, you heard them as they are in truth, the word of God, and it effectually works in you who believe. And so that was his first disconnect. He did not see Jesus for who he really is. And I'm, I'm asking us today, as we approach the Lord Jesus, let's look at him as the king. He's the king. When we stand here and we worship the Lord, we're worshiping the king of kings. We're not just singing along with Janet. We're not just singing words off of a page. We're here to express to our king our devotion, our love, our surrender. He's the king. Second thing, he believed there was something he could do to inherit eternal life. You see his question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? See, we want to do something to inherit eternal life. What can I do? Many times when you share the good news of the kingdom with people, they feel like there's something they need to do. But as this man showed, even though he may have been perfect in some of the law, he was not perfect in, in all. What Jesus requires is perfection. I wonder if there's anybody here who's ever perfectly kept the law. I see your hand. <laughs> I see that hand. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> None of us have. And it was designed that way. The law was designed to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. It basically says that no matter how hard I try, I fail. I need something outside of me. I need a Savior. I need a, a Lord. I need somebody because in my own righteousness, I fall short again and again. And so we found in Jesus the only one who perfectly kept the law. He has perfect righteousness. And when you become a Christian, he takes his perfect righteousness and he clothes you with it. And that's the only thing that enables us to go to heaven. So the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer is, nothing you can do. Jesus said, hey, you know the law. And the guy says, well, yeah, I've done all that. But Jesus uh, was amazing in his communication with this young man because he kept off some of the Ten Commandments. I mean, Jesus knew this guy. He knew he had a heart and he was trying to obey. But you know, that in the Ten Commandments, there are six commandments that relate to man's relationship to man, like don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't murder, those kind. It's man-to-man -man relationship. But there's four of them that deal with man's relationship to God, like don't have any strange gods before me, that kind of a thing. And so... When Jesus said to this young man, you know the commandments, do you see the ones that he pointed out? He pointed out the ones that were man to man. This was a nice guy. He treated people well. He was wealthy, maybe well known in the community. A good man. But see, there was an issue in that he did not hold Jesus as king. God was not the king of his life. And so when the Lord said to him, you lack one thing, it was surrender. Give up everything. Sell everything you have. So Jesus isn't putting out a carte blanche statement saying, anybody here that has any money, give it away or you won't be seeing the kingdom. He said it specifically to this guy because that was his idol. That was his God. That's the thing that he served. And the Lord says, there will be no, no gods before me. He wants to be first. He won't accept being second in our life. And so when I say it costs us something, that's what I'm talking about. What is it? What is the thing in our life 
that keeps Jesus from being first. Keeps him from being number one. For this guy, it was his money. For us, maybe it's something different. But I believe that Jesus is faithful enough to us to point it out. You start getting that little gnawing in your soul. The Lord's putting his finger on something in our lives and saying, hey, we got some baggage between us. And, and see, when Jesus says to lay it aside, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, it's not immediately apparent that there's something good that comes to us as a result of it. We think there's something I'm about to lose. I'm about to give up everything I've worked for. I'm about to lose everything I've held as high regard in my life. And you're telling me, Lord Jesus, that to, to have eternal life, to see the kingdom, that I have to sell everything? And Jesus says, yes, I'm first. He said in another place, if any man loves his father or mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. You might say, That's, that sounds like a mean thing. He is bearing witness to the truth. He wants to be first in our life. There's no other option. And that's what it means to see Jesus as king. We're not in a democracy. We're in a theocracy. He rules. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he rules. The third thing is that Jesus told him to, the one thing he can do basically was to surrender, give everything up. The thing I, I love, I think, most about this scripture is Jesus loved this man. He saw a man who had a heart, a yearning, a longing for God, for eternal life, but he wasn't able to he wasn't able to make the decision. He wasn't willing to pay that price. And Jesus still loved him. Didn't change his status. Jesus loved him. And this man went away sorrowful. Who knows, maybe at a future date, the guy came around. The Bible doesn't give us an answer on that. But I can tell you, if nothing changed... The very thing this man wanted, he lost. You know, somehow he felt he had a greater value, a greater treasure in all of his wealth. And Jesus was saying to him, listen, the thing you really want, you don't see it, but the thing you really want, which is eternal life, is only possible if you sell everything. Jesus was giving him the answer that he was looking for. But the guy somehow could not see that what he really wanted was valuable enough for him to give up everything. And see, that's where we find the, the, the disconnect in our own life. We, are, we say things like, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be 100% for the Lord. I want to follow after him with all my heart. I want to have eternal life. I want to be uh, surrendered to the king. I want to be a servant of God. And then Jesus begins to deal with us because he's faithful to it and he begins to just point out things because he's a God of truth. And we say, I'm not willing yet, Lord. I think I want to hang on to that. I want you to know that whenever Jesus comes to us to bring a correction or a, an instruction that sometimes goes against the grain of our heart, it's always meant for good on the other side. We just don't see it because... Somehow this thing we value more. But it's always good on the other side. It's better. But it's a price. It's a price to pay. The last scripture is uh, in Mark 13, or Matthew 13, verse 44. I think it's on the screen up here. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found, and he covered it up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. You see, that's what, 
This is what Jesus was calling this young man to do. There's something over here. You walk, you're just like walking out in the field one day and you find this treasure. Oh my goodness, look at this beautiful treasure. And it's, it, it captures your heart in such a way that you say, you know what, I'm going to bury this, but I want it, I need this. And I'm going to go back and sell everything I own to get enough money. I'm going to buy this piece of property because I want that treasure so bad. And Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is. That you see something that captures your heart and you say it's worth everything I have to have this treasure. That's what it cost. But you see, when you see the kingdom for what it is, like this man in the story, with joy you go and sell everything you have. But if you don't see the kingdom of God for what it really is, you get bummed out when Jesus tells you to sell everything you have. And you walk away and you fail to receive the joy and the beauty that he has on the other side of that. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. This is the kingdom of heaven, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and he bought it. I love that, that parable about the kingdom of God. So I'd like you to stand with me if you would, close in prayer. A couple of questions to think about as we want to pray and set our hearts to this new year. Well, the first one is, how do you view Jesus? Is he your king? I hope so. Do you believe that he speaks truth? Only truth. If not, what do you think is the one thing is standing in the way. One thing. When you hear it, you might say, oh, I wish he didn't put his finger on that. <laughs> but are you willing to, in a sense, I mean, in a, in a sense, sell everything you have for the treasure of God's kingdom? That's where he wants us to be. Third thing is his truth, his truth is the basis for obedience. When we talk about walking in obedience to the Lord or the, the Great Commission, go and teach them to obey everything I've commanded, it's, it's based on what he says. He is bearing witness to truth. He is a truth teller. And so I'm coming to the place where I say, Lord Jesus, your word is true. What you say is true. I want to obey it. I want to be one of those my servants that are in your kingdom. Our walk with Jesus does not, and it does not make sense unless we sell out to him. You will be walking with Jesus, dragging your heels all the way, Resisting the work of the Holy Spirit, balking against His Word, if you don't surrender. It's just, that's just the way it is. You'll be like that rich young ruler who's asking the question, I want eternal life. What do I got to do? And Jesus says, do this. And you say, that's too big of a price. And you'll go away disheartened and sorrowful. Or you could be like this man we just read about in the, in the parable that you see in that kingdom something so valuable that you say, it's worth everything I have to have that kingdom. And that's my prayer. That as we talk about the kingdom of God and what it's all about, that there would just be this longing in our hearts to say, I want that more than anything. And I'm willing to pay the price.